So here's our three-dimensional drawing of Cavendish's experiment. And I'm going to ask you to draw this little bit of a squiggly up at the top. <clears throat> a little bit of a squiggly at the top and a, a vertical bar hanging down. I'm going to ask you to label this squiggle as a torsion spring. And if you don't know what a torsion spring is, it's a spring that twists. <coughs> and you can even use a torsion spring, um, if you notice how much it twists, to measure force, like a twisting force, a torque they call it, torsion, torque, okay? So it's a, it's a method by which we could let things twist, but also, also a method by which we can measure force that's being used to twist something. So we're, we're going to use it to get at force. Now on the bottom of this, I'm going to ask you to draw a bar. Now this bar hangs horizontally, but I'm, gonna, I'm drawing it three-dimensionally. So this is the bar. I'm going to ask you to draw it three-dimensionally as well. It's receding back into the page. I'm trying to get our heads around a three-dimensional image here. So I'm going to ask you to try and draw it three-dimensionally as well. In the foreground, I'm going to put a big sphere attached to the end of this bar. And I'm going to label it mass 2. And in the background, I'm going to put another big sphere. And I'm going to also label it mass 2. Two mass 2s, one on either end of this bar. Kind of like a dumbbell. Like if you were going to the gym and you saw these big dumbbells, this is mass 2 at either end of the bar. I know they don't have these dumbbells so much anymore, but in the cartoons, right? <coughs> Free weights. <coughs> Now, in the foreground, I'm going to choose another color. Uh, in the foreground, I'm going to have a mass 1. I'm going to make it a big sphere, and it's going to be near mass 2. I'll put it on top of a, a post mounted on the floor. Okay, this is just a thought experiment. And you know, in the background, I could have another mass 1. also mounted on the floor and, and near mass 2, just like mass 1 in the foreground is near the mass 2 that's in the foreground. And if we place mass 1 and mass 2 so that they don't touch, but they're near each other, we could, if we knew where the centers of masses of these two objects were, we could figure out how far apart those two centers of mass, C of M, are, and we'd call them, we call that measurement the R. It's not a radius, it's just the distance between the centers of mass. Okay, that's what that R is going to represent. And if you want to put it in writing, you can. Distance between C of M's, centers of mass, or center of masses. <coughs> <coughs> so this is Cavendish's experiment. And you know, he, he may have uh, built it himself. We're not going to build it ourselves because, first of all, the masses have to be quite large. And second of all, we have to be able to hang them from a ceiling. And I'm not totally convinced that our ceiling could support it, nor am I convinced that our floor could support the M1s. But, but the idea is that if I have fairly massive M1s and fairly massive M2s, what would happen between the mass 1s and mass 2s? What would, what would mass 2 experience? Is anybody willing to go out on a limb here? Yes, sir. Yeah, mass two would go towards mass one. It would be attracted. Uh, what what type of force would it feel? Is it electrostatic? Is it magnetic? What is it? Sorry. Gravitational. Yeah, gravitational force. Now, what you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear is that yes, mass two would go towards mass one because it's attracted to mass one. But isn't mass one also attracted to mass two? Yeah. So it's a mutual attraction, but mass 2, as it seems, is free to move. So what would the overall effect be for our dumbbell? Mass 2 would be attracted and twist around. It would twist, right? And if we wanted to add a twisty arrow on here, we could say, hey, look, it's going to do this. It's going to twist. So let's put it in, in writing. We could say that mass 1 and mass 2 are mutually attracted. I say mutual, mutual because they're both attracted to one another. 
It's just that match, mass 2 happens to be free to move. <clears throat> and I could say the hanging masses, in this apparatus at least, will twist. So that the attractive force could be determined by the torsion spring. Torsion spring. Yeah. Yeah, the torsion spring would have to be fairly reliable, have to be consistent in how it twists, and we'd also have to have some sort of a calibration method to see how much, to, to connect how much this torsion spring twists to what the force must have been between these objects. So we, we would take some calibration to do this, but l let's leave, it, leave that part up to imagination, and we could accept the fact that, is it possible? Do we believe it's possible to do this? I think it's, it's, it's reasonable. In fact, it's been done, so we might as well just say it has been done. It is possible. Um, and th this was something that people were doing to figure out the effect that mass and the distance between masses has on gravity. Okay, so here's what was noticed. Here's a pattern that was noticed. Now that we sort of have the basics out of the way, one of the patterns that was noticed if you, is if you take the actual masses, mass 1 and mass 2, and you multiply their values together, you know, 100 kilograms and 1,000 kilograms, for example, Every time you do it, whether it's 100 and 1,000 or uh, 50 and, and 50,000, every time you multiply them together, if you graph them on the horizontal axis versus the force that one mass exerts on the other, it turns out that you get a nice linear graph. It's really sweet. Mass 1 times mass 2 on the horizontal axis and the force felt by mass 1 due to mass 2, every single time, they're getting a really nice linear graph. And that felt really good. It's like, this is kind of like un unlocking the secrets of the universe type of, type of good stuff. People are like, wow, that's awesome. Never noticed that before. It's kind of neat. It was never noticed before. Mostly probably because nobody set up anything like this before. Um, but, but kind of a neat property. Um, and you know, pe people that come up with these sorts of ideas are, are often fairly wealthy people, or else they're being paid by wealthy people. And things haven't really changed all that much. Um, people still sponsor stuff. Um, people that have enough money still go to university. It, it seems like people that are somehow well off still tend to, to discover new things, mostly because, because, they're, because of their affluency. Increasingly, hopefully, and this is a social issue, uh, more and more people are getting schol scholarships based on their abilities, not based on mummy and daddy's money. But hey, it still happens, and, and hopefully times are changing, and maybe that's why some of the developments are happening faster and faster these days. Maybe people are getting recognized more for their abilities than their money, but Cavendish happened to be in a time where the, the wealthy people got to do stuff like this because they weren't just trying to eke out a living on the farm. Right? Different times, different place. Um, so that was one of the patterns that was noticed. Another pattern that was noticed, and, and you might sort of expect it, if this, in, if this distance between the two masses increases, what do you think would happen to the magnitude of the force? Increase or decrease? Bert? What's that? Decrease, yeah. And what some people sort of thought might happen was this. Don't write it down yet. Maybe it was an inverse relationship. In other words, if I increase the R value, what happens to that fraction? Like R goes from being 1 to being 50. It's in the denominator. What happens to the fraction? Does it get bigger or smaller? Yeah. Smaller, yeah. So an inverse relationship works that way. And they, they sort of thought, well, maybe, maybe we've seen inverse relationships before. What if the, we increase the distance between the masses? Maybe the force is going to in, inversely proportionally vary. So we end up getting a graph that's an inverse proportionality graph. They weren't so far off. It turns out that the data supported this. If you take the, di the R value and you square it, it was proportional to the amount of force that was felt between these two masses. And we call it an inverse square law. Turns out that the graph looked something like this. If you measured the force and you measured the radius between these two masses for multiple experiments, 
<clears throat> you end up getting a graph that looks something like this that follows a 1 over r squared pattern. <coughs> and you've probably done inverse squares in math class. Have you seen this before? We're doing it right now in advanced Oh, great. It's an advanced function. So if you're doing advanced functions next semester, something to look forward to. Okay, but it, it has this nice curved tapering graph look, okay? Inver an inverse square law. So that's, that's the next piece of the puzzle. Cavendish's experiment and the inverse square law and the product, that is the multiplication of mass 1 times mass 2 being proportional to uh, force due to gravity. Actually, it turns out that if you mash these guys together, force of 2 acting on 1 is proportional to mass 1, mass 2 over r squared. Notice I'm, I'm being very careful not to say equal to, proportional to, because we're not at equal to yet. <coughs> 